Thank you, Sean. Um, welcome, everyone. In 1970, humans were extracting from the planet about 30 billion tons of material every year. So the mass of Mount Everest is about 150 billion tons of material. By 2020, we were extracting 100 billion tons. So from 1970, 30 billion to 2020, 100 billion tons of material every year. And it is predicted that but by 2050, we will be extracting 170 billion tons of material from the earth every single year. That is not sustainable. Forget about global warming, forget about, we cannot consume a Mount Everest of material every year and create a livable planet. 90% of it is waste. 90% either is waste in the mining process or it very quickly goes uh, to waste. I'm sure some of you have heard about the concepts of the circular economy. The economy is becoming more linear, not circular. We are actually becoming a more waste generating uh, economy. To make this laptop requires about 1,200 kgs. The, the minerals, a typical laptop is about 1.5 kg, maybe 2 kgs. To get the materials, the mined materials, which is about 1 kg in the laptop, we have to dig up about 1,200 kgs of rock and stone. Right? That is 99.9% .9 waste. Digital technologies are much more intensive on nature and on the planet than any other technologies. These are some of the consequences of mining. Uh, tailing lakes. Most of these tailing lakes, particularly with materials connected with digital, are toxic. They are like open nuclear waste pits with semi-low grade uh, materials, toxins, much of which will never degrade. And they are not built to last. They are built to last the length of time that the companies that make them will make their profits and change their name or get acquired, etc. in the process. These tailing lakes must last forever because their toxicity will never disappear. Right? But we're okay because these toxic lakes are only in poor countries. Water, to make the smartphone that you have requires 1,400 liters of water. To make that laptop requires 190,000 liters of water. Digital is an extraordinarily intensive uh, water uh, requiring environment. A typical data center will consume anywhere from 500,000 to 5 million liters of water every day. Every single day. And they tell us it's all free. They tell us save whatever you want. Plastic. Typical digital product, about 25% plastic. Plastic, another forever invention right, that never goes away. It just gets smaller and smaller until we breed it, until it gets into our blood, until it goes everywhere. It never disappears. Plastic will never disappear. And plastic is not recyclable. The vast majority of plastic, that was just some bullshit propaganda that came from the advertising industries in the 70s to push the blame onto consumers and say, you recycle this stuff that cannot be recycled. Most plastic cannot be recycled. And even what can be recycled can only be recycled two or three times. Whereas stuff like glass or whatever can be recycled forever. Right, so plastic, and we don't even know the consequences of turning our world into plastic, which is essentially what we are doing uh, at the moment. In our products, in our smartphone, is 16 of the 17 rare earth materials, in your smartphone, right, of rare earth materials, and probably somewhere between 50 and 60 metals and a 1,000 uh, plus substances, one of them being uh, brominated flame retardants, right, that stop it going in fire or other sort of protections. These never break down. 
these never break down. We don't recycle electronics. About 15% globally, electronics is recycled. Even what is recycled, we only get back about 30 to 40% of the materials because of the way the products are designed, etc. They're designed so they cannot be recycled. It's called planned obsolescence. It's called making Apple really rich and making big tech companies. It's a deliberate strategy to waste the planet so as to make a small group of people extraordinarily rich. Right. All these, silicon, the base material. Silicon dust causes lung cancer. Silicon has many negative properties as well as um, positive properties. Mercury, one of the most poisonous materials in existence, and you'll find it in most electronics. Mercury, liver uh, problems, brain problems, kidneys, central nervous system, one of the most dangerous metals in existence, and becomes even more dangerous when mercury interacts with water and we dump over 80% of electronics in poor countries. Right. Lead, cadmium, arsenic, lithium, the lithium, the salt plants, these giant salt uh, plains in Chile that use hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of water every day to dry out the lithium uh, that will transform our world into a beautiful green uh, economy. Did you know that the vast majority of pollution that comes from a car does not come from its exhaust, but comes from its tires? And tires are delivering even more pollution today in electric cars because the batteries are heavier and because we're driving around in these electric monster SUV, planet-destroying SUVs in the process. So these are, you know, we can innovate our way to the apocalypse. Who said innovation has to be a good thing? Most innovation today is destroying the planet, right? All these materials, beryllium oxide, copper, tellurium, manganese, tungsten, gallium, indium. They sound beautiful, don't they? Amazing. They're all in our phones. Gold, nickel, chromium. These, these are called forever chemicals. I wonder why they call them forever chemicals. Because they never degrade. They never degrade. And what happens is... When you create so much material complexity and intensity in small devices, you cannot recycle these things. Right? So many of these materials, uh, even though they are scarce and rare, they essentially become invisible from a recycling point of view because of their low quantities in our devices. There's no real way to get them back. They stay in the environment, polluting the water, etc., but we cannot get them back. Uh, because of the small quantities we're using. We use three to four rare earth materials just to make our phones vibrate. Isn't that cool? To do the cool things, three to four rare earth materials required to make our phones vibrate. And that's so essential for society, isn't it? Right. Maybe we could be thinking about material simplicity, about re removing materials from design processes rather than constantly adding as we have been trained to do. Titanium. Much of it is mined in Mexico, in Chiapas, where it is destroying the Cacaluta River, draining hundreds of thousands of liters every hour of water uh, to use these mining farms and polluting it uh, in the actual process. And cobalt and coltan. More people have been killed over cobalt and coltan than in any other conflict since the Second World War. Right? It happens in the Congo. And it's not just people that are being killed. We are destroying wildlife. Much of the mining is occurring in wildlife zones. The western lowland gor gorillas are threatened because of cobalt mining. Mammals, and we are mammals. The entire weight of mammals in the world, humans represent about 30% of that weight. 
of all the, the weight of mammals in the world. Human livestock is 67%, and wildlife is 3%. There's only 3% left, right? We are creating the metaverse, and in that process, we are destroying the universe, right? There will be lions in the metaverse, and to make that metaverse, there will be no lions left in the universe. Is that the world we want? Surely not. Species decline. Marie, since 1970, all of this has kicked off since 1970, big time, right? Up until 1970, all the CO2 humans had been responsible for, we had only created 25% of it. So for the previous 300,000 years of the modern human existence, we were only responsible for 25% of CO2 by 1970. Between 1970 and 1995, another 25%. Between 1995 and 2020, 50% of all CO2. We have gone crazy since 1970. You know what has also happened since 1970? The computer revolution. The technology revolution. Is that an accident? I don't think it's an accident. Insects, 50%. Irish birds. Ireland is an ecological desert, looks green, but we have destroyed it through over farming and various other aspects. Wildlife, fresh water, 83% decline. We can stop this. You know, we can stop this. 90 kgs in our, in our phone. These things are extraordinarily valuable. I'm not saying get rid of phones. I, I grew up on a small farm. We didn't even have a tractor. I don't want to go back there. You know, I, I like having a computer, but we need computers that last at least 20 years. We need phones that last at least 10 years. And it will not happen if we leave it to Google or we leave it to Apple. The only way it will happen through citizen action. That's how we got better health care. That's how we got voting rights. That's how we got most of the things that really matter in society. They were not given by politicians. They were not given by mega corporations. They were given through citizen action. And we need citizen action again to save the planet. 60 kgs of CO2 in the manufacturing process of a smartphone. Typical year of use, about three to five kg. So 80% of the pollution has occurred before you've even bought the thing. And then we're in this extraordinarily vicious cycle where we get rid of this thing that has had such an impact on the planet after two years. That's insane. That is crazy. Hold on to your devices. Fix them. Get them repaired. Right? The battery, lithium, cobalt, oxygen, carbon, aluminium. Just in the battery. Right? Right to repair movement. One of the great movements. Apple, finally, they said, oh, we'll become part. We'll accept the right to repair after trying to destroy it relentlessly. Relentlessly, Apple is trying to destroy the right to repair movement. I'm old enough to remember a day when you used to be able to take a battery out of your phone, right? If you want to take a battery out of your Apple phone, here's what you need, right? They, oh, they says, we'll do right to repair. So I want to, repa I want to change my battery. They send you a 1,200 kg kit that you need to be practically a nuclear scientist to use to remove your bloody battery. And they say, but we're supporting right to repair. Of course we are, right? The mega companies are making money destroying the planet. They're not going to change. They're not going to, even if they want to individually within them, they are not going to change. The change will not occur through organizations. The change will not occur through politicians. The change can only occur through citizen action. And it, the right to repair movement started off as ordinary people and is now sweeping the world. 
global smartphone sales, 15 billion phones since 2007. 15 billion phones. That's 900 million tons of CO2, 1.3 billion tons of material, and 2.5, 2.5, uh, 104 billion tons of water. And this is invisible, this is virtual. Do you know they deliberately created the computer industry in the 50s, 40s and 50s to be invisible? They hid the chemical tanks underground. It was a deliberate policy strategy to say, we are going to create something that's going to, from a marketing perspective, look very different than the old industries. But it was just marketing, it wasn't real. In fact, the new industries are much more dangerous because your phone is essentially like a little nuclear plant. When it, it degrades, it will degrade for thousands and tens of thousands of years if we don't properly and carefully look after it. 1,200 kg uh, of CO2, as I said, for the smartphone. 300 kg of CO2, uh, or, or 1,200 kg of stone, 300 kg of CO2 uh, to manufacture that. 80% of the damage has been done in the manufacturing process. So how do you deal, how do you amortize that, depreciate that? You use it for as long as possible because it created a lot of damage in the manufacturing process. Global PC sales, you know, they say, oh, the phone will replace the PC. It didn't. The PC sales are growing again in, in the process. Nothing ever replaces anything else. It just becomes an add-on in uh, our, our complex world. 1.4 billion tons of CO2, 5.8 billion tons of material, 930 billion tons of water. These are extraordinarily uh, demanding, and they're becoming even more demanding because chips are becoming smaller and smaller and they have to be cleaned because even a, a, a gram of dust, uh, one piece of dust would totally destroy a, a, a chip uh, manufacturing process. And one of the ways they clean it is through ultra purified air and ultra clean water in the process. Uh, paddy farmers, and they're not Irish farmers, they're in Taiwan, uh, are not getting their water because they have to feed the chip factories with the water. Right. 50 million tons of e-waste every year, enough to build a Great Wall of China, and it's doubling every 10 or 15 years uh, in the process. So in another 10 or 15 years, we'll be able to build two Great Walls of China with e-waste. Most e-waste is not recycled. We send it to poor countries. We send it to Ghana, we send it to India. We used to send a lot to China in the process. Uh, it, we, we pretend we don't do that. Sometimes we send it uh, in products that are almost broken, but they'll, you'll get another 12 months out of them in, in the product. We say, oh, but we gave them, we gave them that uh, computer and it's still working. Just work for another 12 months, maybe six months, and we got rid of it out. So now we don't have to worry about that in Ireland or the UK. We solved our problem. We export our waste. Uh, here, this uh, has actually been shot. Uh, this uh, uh, dump last summer was one of the biggest in the world. But globally, there are 18 million children and 13 million women. They send the women out to do this sort of work. It's women's work uh, in the process, because the men, they say, well, I'm not doing that work uh, in, in the process. They use children as young as five to do this work. Why do they use such young children? Because the hands are small, and the devices are very small, and it's easier to pull the wires out of these devices if you're a five-year-old child. If you sm smell this stuff, they often use buns and burners uh, on uh, the boards to get out the copper, the metal. They're going to die 10 or 20 years earlier than they should because of lung uh, poisoning, because of all sorts of impacts. This is an extraordinary uh, burning. This happens very typical, where they burn the cables to get to the copper, the, the other materials. Plastic, when they, that sort of plastic, when it's burning, it's not good. Right? Things must last longer. Let's create stuff that lasts. How do we become designers of stuff that is not trivial throwaway crap? whether it's a website or an app, right? 
Here, a vacuum cleaner, 6.5, should last about 11 years, uh, lasting now about 6.5 years. A washing machine in 2011 should have lasted 17 years, was lasting 10 years. A washing machine in 2021, lasting six years, because we've added, you know, uh, update this, or let's, you know, send uh, to the uh, soap manufacturer that we're out of, you know, all this bullshit that adds nothing except reduces the life of the actual device. Electronics is very brittle, right? We need to get electronics out of as much things as possible in the process rather than adding it uh, to them. A laptop which should last at least 20 years. And they can, right? They can if we design them properly and if we're willing to take a little bit of extra weight uh, with us uh, w when we're actually using them. A lot of what is driving this is data. So data is absolutely exploding. And of course, we're being trained you know, by the drug pushers. It's free, it's free, it's free. Have more of it, have more of it, create more of it uh, in the actual process. Back in 2010, they estimated there was about two zettabytes of data uh, uh, humans had created. A zettabyte of data, I calculated that to print out one zettabyte of data, you would need to cut down 20 trillion trees. So to get paper to print out one zettabyte of data, you'd need to cut down 20 trillion trees. So there's only three and a half trillion trees left on the planet. Imagine how much data that is. One zettabyte of data. And uh, 12, 2018, 2020, 64, it, uh, the initial estimates were 49, then it went up to 64. Look at the way it's going, exponential growth. This is not sustainable. By 2030, we're going to hit data crisis. Already in Ireland, data centers are consuming 14% of our electricity. All of rural Ireland consumes 12%. Already, and they want to double the quantity of data centers in Ireland over the next five or 10 years. Right? Data centers have a big, big, but hidden footprint. They are among the most secretive organizations on earth. And there's a reason for that, because they don't want us to know. They know everything about us, and we know nothing about them. How about that? 28% right? annual growth. And 90% of it is crap, right? And that's not allegorical or that's real. I've been working in the web since 1994. 90% 90 of every internet is crap. 90% of the vast majority of things that exist. In fact, it's even greater in most environments. We are destroying the planet to create digital crap. At least if we were creating something of worth, you could say, well, I, I, did, I killed life on the planet, but I, look at what this, no, I, I, I created digital crap. 1.4 trillion photos we took last year. 1.4 trillion photos. We took more photos last year than in the entire 20th century. Than in the entire 20th century. And we're never going to look at the vast majority of those 1.4 trillion photos. But that's what makes Facebook rich. That's what makes Google rich. Right? They live off our crap because they use it to manipulate us to create more crap. Right? Time to stop. Probability of data reuse, 5% after 90 days. So it's, it's worse than 90% in the process. Number of websites, one point, do we need 1.8 billion websites, right? 91% of which get no traffic from Google. They're not even indexed by Google uh, in, in the process. And website weight, you know, here's some stuff we can practically uh, do in the process. I've been involved in website design since 1995, right? Uh, Around 2005, the typical web page was 0.4. Went up to 0.7, 2010, 2015. Now it's up around four megabyte on average. It doesn't need to be. You can design a great web page with 100 kilobytes, right? 
Most of this is developer convenience or designer convenience or these monumental, stupid, cliche stock images that pollute so much and so many uh, web pages that add zero value. In a typical web page weight environment, HTML will be about 3%, CSS about 5%, fonts, everybody wants a custom font these days when most people can't even see the difference. JavaScript, quite intense. JavaScript is different from everything else because JavaScript isn't just a download issue of weight. It creates processing activity on the device once it is downloaded. So it's a special case is JavaScript. Image is about 60%, but we're missing, we're missing the huge monster uh, in the room here. Right? When you compare it to video, video is 80% of internet traffic. I'm not saying don't have video, you know, uh, but use video wisely. I've been wat watching network engineers for 15 years uh, fix problems uh, in Cisco and other organizations, and not a single one of them wants a video of how to do it. What they want is an installation manual. They want the actual documentation. So often the text is better than the video. Choose carefully when you're choosing a heavy option to communicate with. Always go for the lightest option. There is nothing lighter than well-designed text-based HTML. There is nothing that is better for the environment, so to speak. JavaScript, growth exploding. Most of it unnecessary, right? 37%, uh, this was a study uh, in the Web Almanac, 37% of mobile pages JavaScript are unused, right? It, that's, it, that was 80 petabytes of data a month, the equivalent of having to plant 37 million trees a month to deal with unused JavaScript. We can do better than that, surely, right? The page that you design, use every piece of code on it. It should be used, right? If it's not being used, it's waste. And get rid of the waste so that we don't cause more waste. A JavaScript budget absolute maximum should be 350 uh, uh, kilobytes. In most situations, pages don't need JavaScript because they don't need to be constantly changing for any uh, reason. Even looking, you know, watch, watch the weight of digital. I did a test where I saved uh, a, a thousand words of text in HTML. It came out at 39 kilobytes. I saved the exact same way, the exact same amount in PDF, and it was 141. PDF is horrible for multiple, multiple reasons, but it's also horrible from a weight uh, point of view as well. So just be watching these choices that you make. When we scale, as individuals, they are meaningless. But if we can scale them and convince our organizations and convince others to do them, we can begin to address the actu absolute explosion of data uh, that's uh, occurring at the moment. 405, I was, years ago when I was writing about this, I wrote a, uh, uh, my first book in 1996 called Ireland, the Digital Age, the Internet. I said, oh, it's so much better than sending physical letters and everything like that. And yes, sending an email has less of an impact on the planet than posting a letter. The only problem is every year we send 405 billion letters, but every day we send 390 billion emails, 80% of which are spam. Right, in the process. So I calculated that we would need to plant tw 32 billion trees to deal with the pollution caused by, and a lot of these are not even opened, by unopened emails, by spam, etc. This is the waste email. This is not, I'm not talking about the productive email. 32 billion. So thinking about these things. And oftentimes, the, uh, attachments are, have a real negative impact. And the more attachments, I don't know if you've noticed in your own organizations, but there's, there's a direct link between the quantity of attach, attachments that are sent through email and the crappiness of the internet. The more crappy the internet is, the more people will send attachments because you're not going to be able to find it on the internet anyway, so I better attach it for you. So if we design good intranets where people could actually find stuff, we wouldn't be sending so many bloody attachments, you know. So there's things we can do. There's things we can do. So a lot of, you know, I was, you know, 
trying to figure out things through the 90s and whatever. And, and you know, I read, you know, Jared Spool and Jacob Nielsen and all these sorts of uh, people. And, you know, one of the first rules of user uh, design was you are not the user. You know, that, that's one of the core rules. So that's great, right. So I thought, yeah, well, it's not about me. It's not, you know, we have to look outward. And then you learn very quickly that uh, it was not about the organization as well, or it should not be about the organization. Most complexity is, is not even organizational, it's departmental. You know, departments uh, want to organize things in the way that suits the department, not even the organization. In the, in the process. So you often see most of the problems occur at a departmental level, not at an organizational uh, level uh, in the process. But I discovered user-centered, customer-centered, and I thought, that's it. I'm going to finish my career on that. I've discovered Nirvana. That's what it's all about, right? You know, it's all about the customer. It's all about making uh, it easier, you know, for the, you know, but, Maybe we're making it easier for people to destroy the planet. You know, maybe making it easy isn't always a good thing. I, I, I you know, find it strange even saying that uh, after having spent 20 years talking about how we should always make things easier, et cetera, in the process. I think we have to look outwards. We have to look at the earth experience, not just the user experience, not just the customer experience, the impact of all this on nature and on the climate, on water, et cetera, and make these conscious decisions. And rather than uh, you know, saying, just do it, maybe just don't do it. You know, don't do it. Be the voice that says, we don't need this extra feature. You know, we don't need this extra content. The vast majority of apps never get used, you know, after a couple of months in the process. Why are we going through this really, you know, we are so intelligent, but so unwise, right? We have so, we are so much better educated. Where is our wisdom, right? Our wisdom is out here. We need to regain a sense of wisdom in the world. And it will not come from the big brands. And it will not come from the politicians. Who are we left with? We're left with the people in this room. So the earth experience. Can we move from short-term thinking, delivering superficial wants, to longer-term thinking, solving deep needs? That's the big challenge. That's the transition. This, this is what makes money right now. But can we challenge that? Because only us, only the citizens can really challenge that, in, in my belief. The UK Committee on Climate Change. They said, how are we going to get to net zero? And let's park net zero as even a, a good objective, but it's, it's better than how do we get to destroy the planet by 2050 in, in the process. So, so they, said, they estimated about 38% of the change can come from low carbon technologies. Some behavior change demands 53% and major behavior change demands 9%. We don't need new technology or more innovation to solve the problems that face us. We need to start walking more. We need to get on a bicycle. We need our kids to walk to school, not be driven in monster SUVs. We need to feel safe in the streets, that we're not going to be run over by a technology. You know, technology has taken over our world, right? Our kids are, are spending time on devices because they can't go out. Right? Let's create spaces again where kids can go out and play in the street. That doesn't need a revolutionary weekend brainstorm by a bunch of high paid you know, consultants to figure that one out, does it? It needs parents to say enough is enough. Let's all get on the street and start cycling and walking in the middle of the street as they did in Barcelona two years ago. You know, we can bring about this change. We have a lot more power and all the great changes from health to education to voting came through citizen action in the process. 
a, a survey I saw just last week, almost nine in 10 UK adults don't know what the circular economy is. Right? There's your job, but you won't do it on your own. You know, you, we need to come together into organized groups. You know, individually, we, we get taken off by the marketing or, or the relentless uh, power of these organizations. Uh, and another concept to leave you with, degrowth. Why do we need constant growth? You know, that's a cancer. And we have moved from being consumers of the earth to being devourers of the earth. We need degrowth and we can live very well using technology wisely. But as Rachel says, why do we need to make more shit? We don't. We don't. We have enough technology. We landed people on the moon with technology that's a thousand the power of what's in our smartphone. We don't. We need more wisdom. You know, we need to become much more active. It's not enough for us to get it. If you get it, you've got to convince somebody else and, and try and create something in your locality, a repair cafe or something. I know it's asking a lot in a, a lot of situations, but if we don't act, it's not going to happen. If you're interested in these ideas or whatever, the, my last book, Worldwide Waste, thank you very much for listening.